Well, let's get started again in our uh, working through the medieval church history from 590 to 1517, or as we say, more round figures. The medieval period was from 500 to 1500, which is roughly a thousand years. We're getting a little bit later into the, the conclusion of that era, the 13s, the 14s, and the early 1500s. Uh, the church was a mess, and guess what? A lot of people knew it. And so there were attempts at reform. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, some of you know this verse by heart. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. There's some great promises in that little phrase, that little sentence there. First of all, whose church is it? It's his. Second of all, who's responsible to build it? Him. Third of all, will it succeed? Yes, the church will triumph because Jesus says it will. Uh, as the, the, the church is sort of fading into a, such a quagmire of error in this period of time, uh, the Orthodox Church was a, a mess. The, uh, the apostasy of the Roman Catholic Church, the church was a mess. God was preparing for something. He's never in a big hurry. He was preparing for the Reformation, and he started preparing for it a couple hundred years beforehand. Uh, of course, he knew what was going to happen. One of the things that he did was that he sent some people, even a couple of hundred years before Martin Luther, and it reminds me in the Old Testament how, and Jesus taught this in the Gospels, how he tells the Jewish uh, leaders of his day, Jesus does, that God sent you prophets. He sent you prophets to call you to repent. And what did you do? You killed them. And you didn't listen to them. You, you marginalized them. You, 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 you ousted them, ignored them. And what we're going to see here in the last couple of hundred years, 180 years or so of the medieval period, in spite of the, the downward spiral of the church in terms of being biblical, God was sending people. He sent some mystics. He sent some biblical scholars, not the scholastics per se, but biblical scholars. And he even sent uh, some people to call for councils of the church to address the mess that everything was in. Unfortunately, none of it brought about any lasting change, which of course meant that the Reformation uh, was needed. The clergy lost a great deal of respect from uh, in the 1300s and on into the 1400s. The church's insistence on clerical celibacy, they couldn't marry, um, coupled with the difficulty of maintaining that vow. Uh, led to many clergy having adulterous affairs and having many illegitimate children. And, and in many places, in many places, it wasn't, they didn't even try to cover it up. The priest wasn't married because, no, we're not allowed to marry because we've taken a vow of celibacy. This is my girlfriend and my concubine and this other woman, and these are my 15 kids, and it was a mess. Well, you know, the people weren't stupid. The people saw this, and, and many people said, this, this, this isn't right. Uh, when children came forth from these relationships, priests, I uh, wrote here, who were now, they were now fathers in more than a spiritual sense. <laughs> Not a good thing. It distracted them even farther from their responsibilities. Others in the clergy, on the other end of the spectrum, especially in Rome, and if you were a bishop uh, of a wealthy area, they lived in luxury and they had opulent lifestyles and not only the women and the children but they had all the money and it was uh, very terrible especially while the people lived in poverty and there this doesn't seem right Is it, aren't they supposed to be our spiritual leaders and not our our sort of oppressors and then to top it off as we've learned before what did the church own by this time a lot of the land in europe was owned by the church and so the people were serfs and the church were the landlords and so it, it all caused the people to be saying, I don't know, something about this doesn't seem right. And they were correct. The rank and file clergy were not the only ones to, loon, uh, to lose the people's respect. The papacy, clear at the top, was uh, suffering an image crisis of its own. Uh, the papacy experienced uh, uh, its greatest days, as we've seen in a few lessons past, when Innocent III was on the throne. Um, from Innocent III to Boniface VII, the average pope lasted less than five years. They were changing them very quickly over a period of 78 years, almost 40 years. 
uh, 16 different popes. It was just a mess. Uh, by the time Boniface was the pope, the papacy was considered weaker than an innocent's day. No kidding. Uh, if you remember, that's why he came out with a bunch of edicts about it, more power for himself. But you know what? If you're not a great man, you could pass all the laws in the world saying, I'm great, and it's not going to make you great. And that's what Boniface tried to do, but it, but it didn't really work. Um, this was in part uh, due to the fact that Innocent had alienated both the French and the English by oppressively dealing with them, in, including taxation. More on that later. Uh, Boniface's French successor, Clement, was even weaker than Boniface. So when he was selected in 1305, under pressure from a French king, again, there's the, you remember we talked, for a long time, Europe was just kind of Europe with little tribes, but then these tribes began emerging. There's the Germans in the north, there's the French, there's the English out there on the island, there's the Italians, and they all began to have their own national identities, and they all began to say, what are we listening to the Pope for? We're kings. We don't have to do this. So, so when the Pope would pick someone to be, uh, when, when someone would be chosen to be Pope, people in the other areas would say, we, we don't like him. He's not one of us. He's not uh, kind to, to our sort. Um, so this, this guy was made uh, Pope um, under pressure from a French king. And so what did he do? He moved the seat of the church from Rome to France. That didn't make the Italians happy. It didn't make a lot of the people in the church happy. Uh, he moved eventually, once he got to France, he eventually settled it in a place called Avignon, which interestingly enough was not even technically in France, even though it was a French place. And they, the people, gee, they said, hey, it kind of looks like the papacy's under control of the French. Do you suppose it was true? Yes. It was. The, the Pope became sort of a vassal to the French king um, or kings. Uh, this marked the beginning of what has been termed uh, the Babylonian captivity, which was roughly uh, 70 years. You remember in the Bible, the, 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 the nation of Judah was taken away to Babylon for 70 years before they were restored. And so for roughly 70 years, the, the church was in uh, France. Uh, the papacy was in France, and people called that the Babylonian captivity. The Babylonian captivity ended when a mystic woman named Catherine of Siena persuaded Pope Gregory X to return to Rome. Um, they moved back to Rome. Another pope is there. Uh, this, this is Pope Gregory the the eleventh. Uh, uh, he died just one year after returning to Rome. Upon his death, the cardinals selected a guy named Urban, or that was his pope name, his papal name, Urban V, to be pope. Urban did not lead in a way that pleased the cardinals, and they soon regretted their decision. We picked him, and we don't like him after all. You know, that never happens. Buyer's remorse when you're choosing a person to rule the world. Um, so uh, unhappy with him, they... They elected, it just in less than a year, they elected another person named Clement to be Pope. But Urban, he didn't like to be ousted. He said, well, I'm not giving it up. So now, do you remember this? We had this problem before, and it's happening again. It happened in the, in the, uh, the ten hundreds, the thousand years, and it also is now happening in the thirteen and fourteen hundreds as we're having more than one Pope at one time. So... Um, Urban didn't want to be ousted. He didn't want to give up his throne. So there's two popes again. Clement moved the capital back to Avignon because he still had some dealings with the French. Not too surprisingly, the church was divided over, well, which pope do we recognize? If the pope's supposed to be the leader of the church and indeed the whole world, and we got two of them and they don't get along, uh, who are we supposed to follow? This division is known in the church as the Great Schism, not to be confused with the true Great Schism, which was when the East and West split in 1045. This is another schism within the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, begun in 1378, uh, it was not resolved until 1470, so 39 years later, we have more than one pope. Uh, these developments caused a growing distrust for the papacy among the people. The people weren't stupid. They may not have been educated, but they weren't stupid. They said, what is going on here? And they realized this was not good. So the people were further disenchanted with Roman church due to the oppressive taxation. You know, the Bible talks about giving our tithes and our offerings. Well, 
there wasn't enough coming in. So we're going to levy a tax on the people. That's what the church did. Now, again, think of the nationalism that's going on. The Germans in the north, the French over here, the British over here, the Italians over here. You know, So the Pope says, I want to take money from your coffers of your countries and put it into, and whichever Pope, obviously none of them at this point are English or, or, or German, it's French and Italian going back and forth. But the other people, what are we taking money from our economy and giving it, we're, we're giving taxation to another country in essence, especially as the papacy is bouncing back and forth between Rome and uh, Italy, excuse me, between Rome and, and France. Um, when the papacy was under, uh, you know, it's just because it costs a lot of money to run an organization that runs the world, you know, I mean, who to think it, right? But uh, when the papacy was under French domination during the years of the Babylonian captivity, uh, the, as they called it, the Babylonian captivity, the English especially hated to give tax money because they didn't like the French. Why do I say past tense? Anyway, the English and the French, you know how they get along uh, over there sometimes. Um, and so they, they, the, the English said, you know, the church is just a department. It's just a, a department of the French government. We're not giving money over there. So there's friction, friction, friction going on. Um, the European states were emerging as independent nations. They no, want, no longer wanted to be uh, looking to the papacy for stability, much less to send them money, since these newly emerging nations no longer felt the need for the umbrella of leadership provided by the Pope. They go, get out of here. Leave us alone. Hmm. Well, in the midst of all this, all these problems are happening. This is all just prelude to the problems that are happening. What needs to be done? Spiritual reform comes, or at least attempts at spiritual reform. First, by the mystics. Mysticism was a reaction to rationalism. Rationalism says it's all in the mind. Mysticism says, no, it's all in the emotions. Neither one of those are 100% correct. The mind is important. So are the emotions. Why do we have to choose one or the other? Uh, so uh, mysticism is far more emotive. The mystic movement, like the monastic movement, seems to have been one of God's ways of trying to breathe life back into a cold, dead church. Now, when we look at the, the difference, uh, the mystics tended to be from one of two camps. They were either philosophical or they were emotional. The Latin mystics were more emotive. The Teutonic, which is German, tended to be more philosophical in their outlook. There's a quote in your book, which I think is worthy of reading. The mystics, this is from uh, Dr. Earl Cairns, church historian. The mystic desires to direct contact with God by immediate intuition or contemplation. In other words, God speaks directly to my heart. He speaks directly to me. If the emphasis, con continues Cairns, if the emphasis is, is in the union of the essence of the mystic with the essence of the deity in experience of ecstasy, which is the crown of mystical experiences, then mysticism is philosophical. So is, speak, is God speaking to me through my heart and my feelings, or is God speaking directly to me through my emotions? There's the two different camps within the mystic, mystical movement. If the emphasis is on an emotional union with deity by intuition, then mysticism is psychological. So we have the emotive or psychological versus the mental philosophical. The main objective in either case is immediate, meaning no intermediary. God speaks directly to me. I don't need the Bible. I don't need a teacher. God speaks to me. Um, the main objective is either, main objective in either case is immediate apprehension of God in an extra rational way as the mystic waits before him, God, in a passive, receptive mood. And here's the conclusion. Both types were to be found in the mysticism of the fourth century. Now, let me add to that quote, but neither is to be found exclusively in the Bible because what it, the mystics say, well, God speaks to me. Folks, listen. There's, this stuff goes on today. Some of the best-selling books. There's a whole cottage industry of one particular author, and because this is being taped, I'm not being recorded. I'm not going to say the name, but um, I, I want more than what God gives me in the Bible. So I'm just going to sit here and ask God to speak to me, and then I'm going to write down what God says to me, and then I'm going to write all these books in the first person as though I'm Jesus writing to people. This is dangerous. 
This is cutting the Bible out of it. God, told, God spoke to my heart. How do you know that wasn't a bad can of chili? You know, that might not have been your heart. That may have been something else. It may not have been God speaking. This type of relationship with God was deeply desired by many. It was needed to have a personal relationship with Christ, but not apart from Scripture. Um, this goes into excess. It's a good idea, but it goes into excess. Now, we also already mentioned Catherine of Siena. She lived from 1347 to 1380. A classic example of an emotive or a Latin mysticism. She believed that God spoke to her in visions. No need for the Bible. This is the same Catherine mentioned earlier who persuaded Gregory to return the papal throne to Rome. Although she was uh, connected politically well enough to speak with the Pope, she wasn't afraid to speak against the Pope and to oppose sin, and even at the highest levels of the church. So there's one example of a mystic. That's a, a, a Latin emotive mystic. On the other hand, we talk about the philosophical or the German mystics. This example of this is Meister Eckhart. Meister Eckhart lived from 1260 to 1327. He was a Dominican uh, and he typifies German or philosophical, or we would say Teutonic mysticism. He was so philosophical in his beliefs about God and men that he was denounced by the church. He was denounced by the church. His views on Christian lifestyle contained good instruction for Christians, but his theology was dangerously close to pantheism. God is everywhere. Everything is God. Well, yeah, God is everywhere, but everything is not God. That's pantheism. That's a mistake. Um, one of the groups that was heavily influenced by Eckert was known as the Brethren of the Common Life. Um, they were able to take the good out of Eckert's teaching without embracing the underlying pantheism. One person who was a part of the Brethren of the Common Life, who I do recommend reading if you've never read, is the writings of Thomas A. Kempis. He lived from 1380 to 1471. He's a very notable member of that movement. His book called The Imitation of Christ is about living the Christian life. It is a classic. I still recommend reading Thomas A. Kempis, The Imitation of Christ. Is it scripture? No. Is it infallible? No. Is it good? Yes. Yes. There's some wonderful things to think there, but always, no matter whether you're reading any of these people or you're reading a Christian bestseller of today, filter everything through Scripture. So the other danger that happens in, in to this is placing a great emphasis on the experiential. This is like the whole thing, is it placing the experiential, whether it's mental or whether it's emotional, above Scripture. Uh, this can make Christianity way too subjective. Well, the Lord spoke to my heart. And then it gets even worse when someone comes over and says, you know, the Lord told me to tell you, you should do this. N Stay away from this stuff. Read the Bible. Listen to biblical teaching and form your beliefs and let that inform your practice based on Scripture. So, God sent some help to the church, even as he sent prophets to the Old Testament to bring them to repentance. And the mystics tried, and they made an impact, but they didn't bring the church back around. We'll stop there. Next time we'll pick up and we'll talk about well, who else did God send to the church, even before the Reformation, to try to bring them back.